Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. It's that time of week again where my business partner, Sam Russ, takes over the show and interviews our guests. I hope you enjoy the show. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Sam Rust. Uh, we're excited to welcome to the show today, Kyle Mitchell from the APT Group. Um, Kyle's a real estate entrepreneur who has a focus on multifamily syndication, currently has over $40 million in assets under management. He's the managing partner and co-founder of APT Capital Group and the Asset Management Summit, which I had the good pleasure to speak at here a couple of months ago. Um, their mission with the summit is to positively impact the lives of their investors and the communities in which they invest through the highest level of transparency and fiduciary responsibility. I'm excited, Kyle, to have you today to kind of unpack uh, some of the words that you have there in the statement. Um, but I figured I'd start out with a, a question, maybe a softball question down the middle for you. There's a lot of debate in some corners of LinkedIn or various other social media platforms do you make money at the buy when you're purchasing these larger multifamily properties? Do you make it when you manage or do you make it at the disposition? If you were going to pick apart that three-legged stool, which is the most important? Uh, in your view, which is the most important of those legs and why? Yeah. So all three are definitely most imp are, are very important, right? Um, but when it comes to it, down to it, when you're buying an apartment building, you're buying a business, you know, a multi-million dollar business. And so I would always challenge someone if you went out and bought a business, but bought it right, but had no idea how to operate that business and ran it to the ground, that doesn't, it doesn't matter how well you bought it. So you definitely need to know how to manage a business and manage an apartment building to get the most efficiencies out of it and drive the NOI. So I certainly um, am of the, the thought that it's definitely on the operation side of the business when you really make your money. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, all three of those certainly crucial. You can't really screw any of those up and have a successful project for your investors uh, but I think that asset management is maybe one of the more opaque areas. Uh, a lot of passive investors are focused on evaluating deals. They want to know the basics of underwriting so they can double check the facts and figures. Um, maybe as a starter, what are some of the areas when you're evaluating offering memorandums or when you're putting one together yourself, how do you try to inform your potential investors that, hey, we know what we're doing and what should passive investors be looking for in those offering memorandums specifically about asset management? Yeah, you know, I don't know if there's anything specific in the offer, uh, offering memorandums, but essentially, you know, you've always want to dig in and do your background checks and your due diligence on your sponsor before you go and invest with a group, right? And we're very big on building relationships first and then, you know, getting into the investment piece afterwards. But you want to know that your sponsors or the team, you know, it doesn't have to be me necessarily, although in this case it is, but the team has uh, a plan. Uh, they can execute on that plan and they have a track record there. So, you know, I come from a background in golf, but I was in operations and management for over 20 years. You know, I I managed a thousand people at one point. Um, and so all that to be successful, you need to have systems in place. Uh, you need to have a leadership quality a, a, as a part of it. And then we have project management as well, which um, is a huge part of apartment investing. So you just want to make sure that the team has experience to drive it home. Sure. And maybe we've fast forwarded a little bit here, but uh, some investors that I talk to, they say, okay, so you're part of acquisitions and asset management. So you're at the property on a daily basis, you know, taking applications. Maybe you could explain, back up and explain what's the difference between asset management and property management, maybe for those newer LPs out there listening to us. Yeah, definitely. And I never want to be the one on site dealing with all that for sure. And that's what property management is for. But asset management is essentially holding the property management management company accountable, implementing your own systems and procedures to, you know, partner with the property management company to help effectively and efficiently operate your business plan. You know, if you just hand over the keys to a multi-million dollar 
business to a property management company and they're not doing their job, you know, you're basically handing over your investors money to them. And that's just not what we do. Um, and so we implement systems and procedures to make sure we hold them accountable um, to hitting their goals. You know, uh, you can have the best property management company out there, but still there's always an improvement that's needed. And so we work together hand in hand with our property management company to get the most efficiency out of it. Excellent. You know, switching vantage points a little bit from the LP to maybe more of the syndicators and those who are out there listening to us that are in our chairs as asset managers. Uh, what are some of the key KPIs that you guys have developed or come across that are really helpful in actually measuring real data that is helpful um, for you to know that you're on the right path? Yeah, the two pieces that are really crucial to us is number one, construction management, you know, uh, getting down to the nitty gritty and the days that it takes to turn a unit, the amount of money that it takes to turn a unit um, or full renovation, the process of handoffs between, you know, either eviction or move out to getting it to the renovation team, to getting it back to leasing and then leased up. If you can save a week on all those, I mean, that's huge benefits to your NOI. So that's one area that we really focus on making sure all those uh, things are streamlined as much as possible. And then it comes with the leasing, you know, they say income or revenue cures all evil. And so if you can just drive more and more leads to your property, you have more chances of leases, which end up being income. And so we really focus on that piece, the conversion you know, Neil Bawa talks about this a lot as well, um, of conversions between, you know, your first leads to applicate or to appointments, to showings, to applications, then to leases. You want to be able to track in between all those where your bottlenecks are. And that's essentially what a asset management is, is identifying bottlenecks so that you can solve an issue. There's a lot of bottlenecks to be discovered uh, as our portfolio is scaled. And I'm sure you've seen this as well, Kyle, but things that maybe weren't an issue with your first property or two, when you get to five, six, seven, you start just uncovering things pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the middle of renovating a bunch of units at a couple different properties. I'm curious specifically in tracking slippage of time, like you were alluding to in construction management, how have you guys systematized that process? Are you using Google Sheets? What, what does your turn calendar look like and how do you gain visibility on a, as real-time basis as possible? Yeah. So originally we just started with Google Sheets and it just wasn't working as efficiently as we wanted. So we've moved to Trello. Trello is a, a tool where it's a project management tool and our our uh, construction team creates a board for each unit and essentially gives all the information on what that what's going to be going into the renovation on that unit. Because in some units, it's just an easy turn where it's maybe, you know, flooring and that's it and a clean. Or there's another one that's a full rehab, washer dryers, it needs permitting. So we need to have that signed off on counters, new cabinets, all those things. So that'll be outlined there with a deadline or a time frame of when uh, expected to be completed. And then that board moves along in the process, whether it's in, you know, just move out, then it's in cleaning, then it's in new cabinets, new countertops. And that's allowed us to streamline the process a little bit because everyone has access to that. So our leasing agent and our manager can see where they are in the renovations of each of those units to know when they can start leasing it up or pre-selling it. And who takes ownership, especially on the front end for deciding what is going to need to be done to this unit and inputting the initial data into Trello? That's something that we're toying with on our side and trying to figure out what's the best. I'm curious how you guys have approached that problem. Yeah, so it's it's certainly not um, a perfect uh, solution for sure. And there's always, you know, human error involved or human just behavior involved. But essentially, it's the project management person on the rehab team and our manager on site. Um, you know, we have our weekly calls and we talk about what our renovation program is and we try to keep it as structured as possible so that they can make decisions quickly. I think where things become a little difficult is if you want to do something different to every unit and then they've got to call the owners and get by in there and that can waste a day or two. Um, and so as soon as a unit becomes available, the, the card or board that's created is created by our manager. And then that gets pinged to everybody. So it's not just going to go to one person. It's going to go to everyone and everyone can see if that person's not responding. So everyone's held accountable because it's, a, it's done in a group, but essentially the manager on site is the one that's going to start the board and then ping the, the renovation manager. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Do you push down 
ownership of individual tasks to guys that are on your renovation teams? Uh, and maybe another follow-on question to that would be, are you doing renovations in-house? Or are you bringing in third-party contractors? How do you integrate from the bottom? Yeah. So our property management company has an in-house GC and a renovation team, which we really like. Um, I mean, there's benefits and, and downside to it. The benefits is that everyone's worked with one another and they're all within the same company. And so they all, you know, they all are on the same processes and procedures. That's why moving over to Trello for us wasn't a big deal because they had already been doing that. So they're used to that process. You don't have to retrain them on that. And, you know, when you're holding uh, your third party property management company accountable, it's the whole team. And so uh, if the renovations start to slip, you know, obviously that uh, falls back on the property management company and we can talk to ownership as a whole. But I, I think just from managing, you're not managing multiple different vendors. Yes, you're managing different people. Uh, but since it's all under one umbrella, it's, it's worked really well for, for us. Yeah, well, that, that's excellent. A lot of good stuff there. So it sounds like your property management company is maybe embracing technology. Maybe they're, uh, they're already used to using some of these tools. Is that correct? Yes. I would say 12 months ago, no, but uh, they've been more open to that. And that's why we love this property management company. Look, there's no property management company that's perfect. They are a little bit archaic in, every, in, in the way they do things. But when we suggest something, they are open to taking a look at it. Obviously, there's added cost to some of the technology that has to be implemented, but something like Trello, very cheap. And from project management, I mean, that's what they do. So they definitely need to have some type of tool to use uh, for project management. But yeah, they are open to using some technology. Oh, excellent. And I'm curious, I think in, in different contexts and at different conferences, you'll hear people in our seats, you know, really rail on third-party property management, or there's kind of the sense that, hey, if they had the time, they could manage the property better than a property manager. A little bit of arrogance will creep in from time to time. You know, I have a lot of respect for good property managers. Uh, anybody who's taken the time to really dive into that industry, master uh, the craft of leasing and, and managing a property. How do you try to respect the, the core competencies that your property management partner possesses while at the same time bringing in additional ideas, thoughts, tools like Trello and try to move everybody forward? How do you strike that balance? Yeah, it's all about coming from a place of wanting to help everybody, right? I mean, this is not just about us. This is actually a lot of things we do actually make it easier for the property management company once it's implemented. But a lot of people don't like to try new things. You know, time is very limited in property management. They're doing everything. They're carrying all these different balls. But we've just come from, you know, number one, starting from the beginning. When we hired this property management company, we told them that these are the ways we want to manage our property. These are the things we want to see. And yes, we're going to ask for things to be customized. But we have a great relationship now where we can push back on one another. We can have good conversations on how to best make our property man get the most efficiency out of it. Um, but it's looking at it as they're a partner. This isn't, hey, you got to do it this way. It's, hey, let's have an open forum here. This is what we're thinking about doing. What are your thoughts? What what are the positives and negatives of this? And then have a conversation. And a lot of the times it's it's not just what we want to do, maybe it's a blend of what everyone wanted to do to get to the right answer, right? Because they absolutely do have boots on the ground. They have the most experience. They're there on the day-to-day -day business. And a lot of the things that ownership wants to implement, sometimes it's not reasonable or just can't be done with what they're being given. So a lot of the times it's like, hey, we can get this done, but we may need more payroll. Or, you know, is there a middle ground here on what we can do? So it's really just working hand in hand with your property management company. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you guys have been hosting the Asset Management Summit. Um, you've seen a lot of different operators come through, different folks speak as part of your platform. You know, what, is, uh, what motivated you guys to go down that path and provide those resources for the community at large? Yeah. So, you know, there's a ton of education. We hit on it in the very beginning about getting your first deal, raising capital for a deal, closing on a deal. And it's so exciting. And all those things are very important to anyone's development if you're going to get into this industry, but you also need to learn how to manage a property and, you know, good operators can make a bad deal great and bad operators can make a good deal bad. And so uh, Gary and I, my business partner, Gary, our background is in operations and management, and we've spent decades and decades kind of uh, crafting that. So we saw a niche that was not being kind of educated on and our asset management summit is free, right? We want this to be out there. So when people 
buy their first property. They're not like, hey, what do we do now? How do we how do we turn this around? The last 10 years has been a phenomenal market. And so you could have almost done everything wrong and still gotten away with it. And I think the tide's turning, you know, the market's definitely nearing the top. And so the best operators are the ones that have the systems in place and know how to operate their business. And they're the ones that are going to succeed. And, you know, if you buy wrong, which I would you know, argue that a lot of people are right now, then if you don't have that operational piece, you could really be in trouble. And so we are just passionate about educating people on all things, asset management, on how to get, you know, drive your NOI, get better systems and work with your property management company. Yeah. You know, acquisitions is maybe a little bit of a sexier topic, uh, but have you found that getting better at asset management has made acquisitions maybe a little bit easier or at least the underwriting process, you have more confidence in your numbers and you know efficiencies that you can bring to bear when you see a T12 of a property that maybe has had some slipshod management? Yeah, I mean, you know, from our vantage point, we always look for operational plays. And so that's something that's benefited us well is we're not just looking for, you know, an income play where we can add, you know, 10 grand in the interior and drive the income. We're also looking for operational inefficiency. So I think it definitely allows us to see things others don't. Um, but it also has given us more opportunity. But you know, just just trying to improve little by little on the asset management side has just made us much better operators. And even through COVID, um, you know, as bad as COVID has been, and, and the fact that we don't want we didn't want COVID, it's made us better operators. You know, you've had to pivot. You've definitely had to do things differently. And if you didn't, you know, you're probably sitting in a different boat. But um, it, it's made our operations much better. Our our relationship with our property management company better. Our relationship with our residents even. Even much better. Um, and so looking back, you know, it's, it's uh, been almost a blessing. Yeah, I, w- I would echo that. And what you said earlier about the last 10 years, you could have bought anything you could hit with a rock, you probably did fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think that's going to be the case in the next 10 years. Uh, people are getting smarter returns have compressed significantly. Um, you know, I'm underwriting a property right now in one of our markets where they bought it for 15 million four years ago, and now it's on the market for 40 million. Um, and it's it got 10% loss to lease and 20% physical vacancy. It's like, like you ran it into the ground and you tripled your investment. Uh, that's not going to be the case. And that's a horrible business plan to underwrite to. Right. <laughs> um, but really getting good at asset management is going to be crucial in the next phase of the cycle. Um, for those people who are just starting out in multifamily syndication, you have Attorney saying you need to have the structure figured out. You have, um, you know, acquisitions and underwriting questions that are clearly top of mind. What's the minimum that someone needs to be able to know, or questions that they need to be able to answer of themselves, even before they can go out and execute their first deal? In your opinion, something that gives them the competency, but also doesn't lead to uh, paralysis by analysis. Yeah. I mean, the great part about multifamily is that it's a team sport, right? So the thing that you should be asking is, do I have the team to get it done? I mean, I don't have to do underwriting acquisitions, capital raise, asset management, disposition, all that. I just have to have the right team around me. So the thing I always like to tell people is, do you even know, you know, to take down, let's just say a $10 million deal, do you know who has to be on your team to do that? Even from the lending side, the asset management side, capital raise side. And I think when you break it down, a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know we needed that net worth on liquidity or that experience or you know that much of a capital raise. So I think the right question is, who's, who's the team that's going to take this down? And if you have all the little pieces, then you're going to be fine. You don't have to be the most experienced in the group. Awesome. And if you don't mind sharing, how do you and Gary um, at APT Capital Group, how do you guys share those responsibilities um, and, and divvy up your roles? Yeah. So we have started hiring, which has been a blessing as well. We've got an executive assistant. We're going to hire an operations manager. And what they're going to be doing is a lot of the back of the house, um, investor relation things, emails, communication, but also, you know, marketing. We also do our own marketing and leasing on our end to where we have additional um, sources and additional units kind of online to generate more leads for our property management company. And we refresh those leads. And so they'll be doing things like that to generate leads and send those to the property management 
management company and book them. And that takes additional support for sure. Gary and I couldn't do that. Um, but luckily, Gary and I both have a background in operations management. So what we do is we we split our, our portfolio. So if we have four properties, he'll take two, I take two, and we're the leads on it. But we always confer with one another on, on the business plan, obviously, if it's not going according to plan, which, you know, nothing goes according to plan. You've always got to pivot. You've always got to make decisions on something that's happened. Um, and so we work really well together in that sense, but we do just assign a lead to that, to that property. Well, that's excellent. So at what point does the lead transition? And, and I keep diving into the ownership question, because I find when you don't define who owns a task, uh, then it often doesn't get done. So you guys are generating these leads in-house within APT Capital Group. At what point do those leads get transitioned over to your third-party property manager? Yep. So they get emailed straight over to the property manager. And then the property management company has to acknowledge the fact that they receive that lead. Um, and then we cross-reference that our assistant does on a spreadsheet to make sure it's being input into the property management system and followed up on. Um, and that's how we kind of track our conversion ratios too. Because if you're generating a hundred extra leads a week, but none of them are resulting in leases, then you know they're, they're, it's almost wasting time to the property management company because they've got to follow up with bad leads. So we want to make sure we're generating good leads. So that's the system. Now I want to get it to the point where we can actually just have our assistant book straight into a calendar of the property management manager uh, for an appointment. Cause if we can get that lead into an appointment, that's even better. You know, when, once they're on property, we can close them. So that's the ultimate goal. We need a little bit more um, staffing to help us with that. But uh, I, I think that'll be something we'll implement in the next six months. Well, that's fantastic. I think owning the marketing piece of that is an underrated part of asset management. So many people think, oh, my property manager will take care of that. And, and, and maybe you have the diamond in the rough that will, but more often than not, they are a little bit more on the archaic side when it comes to technology. And especially for those of us who are a little bit on the younger side, we can help leverage technology to drive more traffic to the site. One of the challenges that we've had um, is driving qualified traffic. And you briefly yep. touched on that, Kyle. What are some threat metrics that you're trying to hit as far as qualified traffic? Um, and maybe could you share a source of good traffic and maybe a source that didn't uh, didn't send qualified leads your way? Yeah, non-qualified leads would be like a Craigslist, right? We get a lot of bad leads from that um, in one market, but another market actually we get good leads. So uh, interestingly enough, they, they, they change. And so that's even the step further is I always encourage people to dig or take, peel back the onion one layer further when you're talking about asset management. Um, you know, ask that question, try. It doesn't mean because Craigslist doesn't work in one market, it won't work in the next. Um, but going back to your question, yeah, generating bad leads versus good leads is really important. And we have had some challenge with that. And it's just about tracking it. If you're not tracking it, you don't know if they're bad leads or not. And so uh, some of the qualifications we have is we, we want two and a half times income. We want to make sure they have no evictions, no criminal record, um, and they have a job currently, right? Um, and so some those are some of the qualifications. There's other ones that go a little bit deeper, but we make sure we do a full background check on all of our residents to make sure we're putting in the right person. That's even more important right now with eviction moratorium. Just because you're leasing someone up doesn't mean they're going to pay rent. And then now you've got you know less inventory with no one paying rent in that one. So that's going to be a huge factor. Yeah, that is definitely true. Making sure your standards are rigorous and that they're being followed is so important right now because the the churn is just so much less. It, it's hard to get people to move out, especially in markets like Phoenix, where you guys invest, um, where it's just so hot and occupancy is at or near all time highs. Um, oftentimes, I I remember stories more than uh, oh, the facts and figures. Though facts and figures are important. Do you have a story? of a situation that maybe was a little bit unique or a problem that you had to deconstruct in a new way um, on one of your assets that you could share with our audience? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the right one to, to kind of talk about. You know, with COVID, uh, we definitely had a lot of situations that came up and there was challenges that came up. And, you know, a couple of them that come to mind is more people were staying home during COVID, right? And so the utilities actually went up. Um, drastically in, in some of the cases. And so did crime in our areas as well, because more people are home, they've got nothing to do. And so, you know, there wasn't a 
perfect solution, but implementing, you know, courtesy patrol for a couple of months to get the crime down. Cause I think, you know, your biggest cost is turnover. And so if crime is something that is now being, you know, it is now a big problem at your property and you don't do anything about it, uh, you're going to have a lot more turnover and that's going to cost you a lot more money. So that was something that we had to do. That was a challenge, obviously not budgeted for because previously we didn't need it. Um, utilities being high was a challenge. One thing that we implemented at our pro um, properties recently is conservice. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a third party billing uh, for rubs and you can capture up to 95% of your actual utility costs. And so in that case, if the residents are using more water, then that's going to be passed on to them, which essentially has been great for us because now we're capturing more than we had originally planned. But also if utility bills go up like they have, it's not going to hurt us as much as just charging a flat rate rub. Sure. That's a, that's a link to that in the show notes for sure. Um, you know, pivoting to a little bit bigger picture here, Kyle, um, as we wind down a little bit, uh, I'm going to ask you to play Nostradamus here. What do you think happens in commercial real estate in the next 12 to 24 months? It sure seems like we're hitting a frothy point, an inflection point. You mentioned at the top of the interview that people are purchasing properties that maybe they shouldn't be buying, or at least not at that price. Um, elaborate a little bit more on where you see this going in the next two years. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the market that you're in, right? Every market's going to be completely different. Um, and so I speak to Arizona and it, I love Arizona because of all the metrics that you want from a fundamental standpoint are there, whether it's population growth, in-net migration, uh, job growth, but most importantly, job diversity. And I think that's like, that's my number one when I'm choosing a market is looking at the job diversity. Back in 08, you know, Arizona got crushed because they were heavily reliant on lower paid jobs, construction jobs, and they've done a really nice job um, bringing new jobs into the into the market and being more diverse, uh, even bringing tech jobs, so higher paying jobs. Um, and then how much construction is happening, you know, is another thing that we're looking at. Um, and in certain pockets, there's a lot more than others. We love Tucson because there's not a lot of development there um, and the demand is still there. So uh, there's a lot of things to unpack in the next 20, 12, 24 months, depending on which market you're at. I think it's important right now to, you know, remain conservative on your underwriting. Don't just do a deal just to do a deal. And you got to make sure it makes sense in the long run. Right now, I think everyone's in that fever where they've got to have a deal and they're going to, you know, just buy anything and hope for the best and hope for cap rate compression and hope for appreciation. And I think that's where it gets a little bit dangerous, especially in, you know, if you're in a California market, it may be a little bit different because it is an appreciating market. But when you're in these tertiary markets, you're hoping for appreciation. That could be a, <laughs> a bad sign. Yeah. If you're baking in appreciation, if your revision cap rate is anywhere close to what you bought it at, that, to me, that's a warning sign um, that maybe you have rose tinted glasses. And, and I love optimism. I just don't love it when I'm investing money behind it. Uh, yep. I'm a very conservative outlook. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, Kyle, but biggest risk in real estate in your mind right now, and how do you guys control for that? Yeah, biggest rate risk right now. I mean, you've got rising interest rates, so possibly cap rates are going to start to um, go the other way where you've seen a lot of cap rate compression as of late, but just buying right. You know, I just, I think there's so many people out there with a competitive market where you just, you need to be too aggressive to buy. So I just think, you know, don't just do a deal to do a deal. Yeah, yeah. We're finding that to be more and more true that the guys who need to do the deal, whether it's for the fee income or just to build the brand, the temptation is so real to cut corners. Um, and, and I'd rather see somebody who's put out a deal, one deal in the last 18 months than the guy who's constantly pumping them out, all of the things being equal. It's just, it speaks to the quality of the person if they're willing to be patient and let the right opportunities come their way. Yeah, we had to go 13 months between our second and third deal. And it was, you know, excruciating. And uh, we underwrote hundreds and hundreds of deals. And at a certain point, I was like, are we ever going to get a deal? But, you know, it's just the best deal is the one that you didn't do, as they say sometimes. And so you do have to just stick to your guns. And uh, I, I do think the better you know a market, you know, that's why I moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, you can be more realistic on some of the things. Whereas, you know, if you don't live in the market, you're not there often, you're, you're you're making a lot of assumptions. Um, now we have a portfolio here so we can comp off of our own portfolios. We understand business plans more. So I do think your underwriting develops as you get more experience in a given market. Uh, definitely. And that gives us an advantage, but at the same time, you still have to be careful. Yeah. Real estate is ultimately not a fair sport. 
uh, the, the longer you're in it, the more of an advantage you have. Um, and so kudos to you guys for, for getting the hardest part done and really beginning to scale in some pretty serious ways. Um, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success, Kyle? Yeah, it's, it's got to be my consistency. It's just, I always tell people, if you want to separate yourself from your competition, just be consistent because 95% of people have a very difficult time being consistent. And I'm not talking about for two weeks or a month. I'm saying for years and years and years, kind of like you and you and Whitney, how long has he been doing this podcast, right? I mean, it's been years and now he's, you guys are very successful. Uh, and, and this is one of the reasons, not all the reasons, but that's consistency every day, 365, that's what it is. And so we're very, um, we're very, we put a lot of energy and effort in being consistent with what we do, whether it's from our asset management side, investor relations, or even deal acquisition, we're just very consistent in what we do. Yeah. That, that consistency and that repeatability will take you a long ways. So mm-hmm. I appreciate you speaking to that. Um, how do you like to give back Kyle? Yeah. So I do some uh, coaching, um, you know, just getting people who are just starting into multifamily to make sure they understand not just the asset management side, but just any coaching in general. I like to see people succeed uh, who have hunger and passion. And that's how I was. And I was lucky enough to find mentors when I was getting into the business that really helped me get to the point where we're at today. And so I just think that's a big piece of our industry. I love this industry because I think everyone is so open. They're willing to give back and they want to see others succeed. And uh, I'm definitely one of those people. Oh, that's fantastic. Kyle, before we let you go, is there any resources that you'd like to point our listeners to? Anything that uh, would be helpful for them in their journey to become best real estate syndicators possible? Yes, yeah, I appreciate that. Actually, today our book is launching. It's called Best in Class, and it has to do with everything we talked about today and more. You know, leasing strategies, marketing strategies, building a team, even due diligence. So uh, you can pick that up on in Amazon, uh, and that is launching today. So perfect timing here, and it's called Best in Class. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you all for joining us on the Real Estate Syndication Show. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.